So we are starting now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us to another Startup Canada webinar of the Women Entrepreneur Series. Uh, for those ones that haven't participated in this series before, Startup Canada launched the Women Entrepreneur Program to provide support during COVID-19, but also to provide general guidance to entrepreneurs in starting and scaling their businesses and all of the moving parts that this implies. Mm -hmm. um, those who don't know me, I am Maria Aponte, Program Manager at Startup Canada. I'm thrilled to present Achari Moss, entrepreneur and author of Be Ready to Dance with Your Customer, a book that I personally uh, love since the first page. Um, I met Chari while I was pursuing my Master's in Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Queen's University, and Chari was invited to the program to talk about the topic that we will address today. Um, Chari Moss spent the first 20 years of her career climbing the ladder of customer service, growing from direct client care to VP of sales, and all the way to business owner in telecommunications. This experience had made Sherry one of the foremost experts uh, of customer um, service, and in this webinar, she will open your eyes to the true fundamentals of amazing, attentive customer service. Um, as I said before, she's the author of Be Ready to Dance with Your Customers and Table Talk. Um, Sherry, it's a delight uh, to have you here sharing all your wisdom about this wonderful and fundamental aspect of every business in every industry, uh, customer service that leads to customer success. Uh, Sherry, I will pass things to you uh, to give, uh, for you to give a brief introduction of who you are, your journey in customer service, and what can we expect from this webinar today. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure, I'm going to say, working with you these few weeks for um, this webinar that we're doing today. It did not get past me right from the very beginning when you reached out to me that you have a level of customer service that is very professional. And if there's one thing I stress to people who are just starting out, it doesn't matter, you know, what industry, what platform, what age, is to always have um, that in mind, to always put your focus where it should be and to have a level of professionalism, as you did, in your language, in how you followed up, and in your desire to bring this to people. So, thank you. Um, just to give you, first of all, to give you an idea, what we're going to do today is quite literally just have a very open and frank conversation around something that is essentially fundamentally so important to all of you, to everyone, and that's customer service. We're going to leave it quite open because feel free to uh, ask for clarification, ask for examples, and any questions you have. It's all important and it's all very relative, whatever you're thinking. So um, as Maria knows, there's a quite a long um, history into my, um, the world of business at a very young age, at the beginning of my book, because it was the early 80s and it has its own department of degree of, toughness for young women working in, in um, you know, in, in entrepreneurial positions or even in big business. Um, you know, never mind the, you know, we've got our past history on that. And we've certainly got the way things are right now. But the 80s were a particular time. Women had to really work hard. Um, and my, in my efforts were to A, learn as much as I could about my industry and B, uh, never let go, never let up, just uh, find what the best recipe was for me in customer service. And those two things, the knowledge I was gaining, the experience I was putting myself in, propelled me into, um, you know, great positions later on. I started on, um, you know, inside sales, the order desk sort of thing, uh, relationship moving out to outside sales, moving into sales supervisor, but always honing and refining my, my work at, in customer service. It was incredibly important to me. That was my leg up at those times when, 
you know, there are some fabulous stories in the book, but really the limousines and the martini steak lunches, they really did happen then. But that was the, 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 there was the men doing that. So while they were busy treating customers that way, my competition, I was getting on the scene and I was talking to as many people as I could, whether it was QC, production, marketing, you know, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, learning as much as I could about my industry. But enough about that, because what I really want to open up for you today is this. And yes, I did eventually um, co-own a distributorship, um, Wireless Telecom. At the time, it wasn't wireless. So we were very, very, because of our great uh, work in customer service, we had, you know, big, big clients, Northern Telecom, GE Westinghouse. Um, when it became wireless, we were ready and we were already treating them so well that it was natural for them once we opened on our own to, to carry on with us. And that's really where we launched ourselves into what we did. But let's just take a step back for a moment and look at the past. It's as far in terms of customer service after the war. So we're talking about after the second world war and the world began to recover and families were, were getting larger. And at those times, it was really about what we had. You know, you, the family had a car. The highlight of the, the week was a family drive. Um, you were grateful for being able to provide, you know, good food and uh, schooling, you know, education and a nice environment for your family and for your kids. And just, just if, you, if you can remember, if you can think of this image, but the gas station attendant, he wore a, a, a crisp uniform with a little tie and a jaunty little hat, and he owned the gas station. And he took it quite seriously, and so that's how he, he himself looked after you. Just think of today, what, which, how gas stations appear today, and you'll understand the difference. But because what we ended up moving into into the 80s was a, we went from what we have to what we want. And there was a, a, a huge influx of commercial goods. It became highly commercialized. There were things we had to have, but now of course, you're, now you've got both uh, partners working. VCRs, dishwashers, microwaves, the second TV in the bedroom, the second car in the driveway. So we didn't care how we got it. We didn't necessarily be so concerned with how it was um, presented to us service-wise, we there were just things we knew we wanted to have and develop. So that's where we began to have this decline into what I call today, which luckily we're, we're moving outside of it and it's, it's actually rising again, but what I call today is a customer service crisis. And if you don't believe me, let's go take a walk because I can show you examples on in, in one street, multiple examples of, of what I mean by that. And really it's about Nobody is giving their, their entire focus. They're all their 100%. And it's, it's everywhere and it's all around you. Um, luckily, that is beginning to change. And I see it changing because the young people, where the millennials and the generation behind them, you have begun to change that simply by making uh, more of a demand for it. You're very particular about where you are shopping and what you're buying. And let's face it, at the speed of the light, you can tell the rest of the world any kind of bad customer service, naming the product, the company, what have you. As a matter of fact, that's one thing that you need to understand is you're generally looked at for your, you know, for any one transaction. People tend to talk about the bad experiences. Very few people tell their good experiences. Must be pretty elevated for people to share it with everyone. Okay, so today I'm going to call this actually your homework, um, your first lesson. And this is what I want everybody to do leaving here. It's very important for you to actually see, for you to actually observe. And, and, and Maria and I had a great conversation about this before this, um, before this lecture. It's very important for you to get out into your communities, into your worlds, into the places you shop, the places you, you um, communicate with service going on. We'll just, we'll call it communicate with service going on because it doesn't matter what platform, online, over the phone, or in person. 
I want you to open your eyes and your ears and your mind. And I want you to pay attention that everything's going on around you. Because trust me, once you start doing that, A, you're going to start to see things much differently. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, wow, I didn't realize this before. It all matters. So, and when I say observe transactions, I'm talking about the ease of it, the comfortableness of it. That's very, very important. How attentive your service, the service was to you. I say attentive because it could be online, it could be in person, it could be over the phone. And all the way to follow up, something that there's a very good chapter in the book that talks about follow up. We might get into that today, but that's very, very, very important. The transaction does not end when the, when the customer walks away. It doesn't matter if it's a one time purchase, it never ends when the customer walks away. There's always still room for follow up. Um, because he will talk about you. So you're looking for the differences in the setup, how it's set up, how quickly and how graciously it's given to you. Now, the other thing about today is we're also going to go very deep. It's not necessarily, I'm going to ask you to think about this. It's not necessarily what you think you're seeing. You have to be willing to be wrong in how you're interpreting it. And when I address you, I'm addressing you as the shopkeeper. That is my terminology for somebody who is running the shop or the owner or, or both. It's the same difference to me. So you're going to be looking at the whole line start to finish. And that is something that people often too many times today, they're, they're not quite aware of that they're not doing this. Now let's, let's talk about where, where your product or your service starts, okay? The whole line, there's R&D, there's marketing, there's product design, there's location, there's your target uh, client, your target, target audience. And then what happens when you do all of that? We've got it. We know what we're supplying. We know how we're going to package it. We know who we're going to target this to. And we know it's the best one and it doesn't exist and it's going to be fabulous. And then what do we do? We go, okay, here, go. And we sit back and we watch. And we just leave all our customer service staff, who, by the way, is not the end of the line. They're the front line. And that's the reverse thinking I want to put you guys into. Okay, there's the mind shift. They're not the end of the line to all of those fabulous things got, that were done. They're front line. But we tend to just say, okay, go. And then we stand back and we watch them. Something goes wrong. Well, it must be their fault. Absolutely not. They are just as much of the team as you are. They require just as much as the knowledge, the experience, the training, the teaching, training again, the proper work environments for them, training again, because you're never not there. You're going to be learning so many things that are happening that you don't know until you're ready to sell your product and service. How could you know everything? You haven't, you haven't had customers yet that you're going to be listening to. So your frontline staff. Now, I used to go into groups and say, there would be students, let's say in a university, but they'd be students, some had part-time jobs, some had, you know, were in engineering, some were, et cetera, et cetera. So how many of you are in customer service? I would be lucky if half of them would raise their hands. I would raise both my hands because every single one of you, it doesn't matter what you do, you are in customer service. And that's the reason for the terminology of, of be ready to dance with your customer. I'm not talking about you with your customer. I'm talking about you collectively together for your customer. That is a very important distinction. You were all very important. So you all need to learn and work with each other and have the dance together. Okay, so that's where we're at. Are there any questions yet? Does anybody have a question? Um, not for now, people are introducing themselves. So uh, to the audience, as we go through this presentation, uh, we will accept questions. Uh, we have the, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's a Q&A button for you to ask all the questions to the panelists, to Cherry, and we have also the chat um, box that is also where you can also put your comments uh, relevant to this presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Uh, let me move my little chat thing over here. Okay, 
So I'm going to tell, this is, this is the best way for me to explain to you what I mean by going very deep and really seeing things and questioning things. I belong to a, a very, um, a, a very nice, very large, they have a chain everywhere, uh, fitness facility. So I call it a gym, but it's, it's, it's really an athletic club. And they have a great many things to offer. Um, I use it for what I use it for. But on the main floor, right in the very center, I want you to imagine this, okay? It's a very, very large building. And this, this one floor is like, uh, the very center, there's a big desk. And there are four people working. They are in staff uniform. And, and there's a wraparound desk and some have computers in front of them. And we are all around them. The, the mat work over here, the weights over here, the cardio machines over here. And I walk in and I see every single one leaning back in their chair. We'll get to the reason for that in a moment. Leaning back in their chair, their phone's in their hand and they're down. Now they're, they're down here, but for you, to, for you to see me, down every single one of the four. So the point here is, I want you to look beyond the obvious. Is what, what's the obvious reaction to that? Well, the obvious reaction is they're on their phones in the middle of all their clients, their customers, you know, moving around them in this room. But that actually isn't the way I want you to see it. I want you to ask yourself this. Why is it allowed? Why is it allowed? Who has allowed this to happen? I don't blame any one of those four if that's the norm. So that comes from way back here and up here. Where is the, um, where's the, I'm going to give it a, a word from today. I'm going to say mantra because everybody likes that word today. So what I call is the promise to the customer. Now, before anybody starts any type of business, I insist that they make, they write for me. If they ask for, me, for my help in, in, you know, some sort of development, Okay, what's your promise to your customer? I need to have that first because that's where you start. You start way back here. When they give the promise to the customer, that becomes your mantra and that becomes the basis to then move forward to train your customer service staff to make sure we're all on the same page, we're all dancing together. So from the promise to the customer comes the training and you make this, you, even, you write it out, you put it somewhere where it's completely visible but you keep training on it and you, and you have to be very consistent with it. You have to always refer to it. You have to be consistent. Then you have to watch. You, you can't just throw them on the floor. And I like the, the language of on the floor. I've had people come to me and say, uh, had successful businesses grow, grow, grow and say, yeah, but the experts, they tell me I should never be on the floor. My role is, you know, is a, a... no, you're always on the floor. You or someone else is that you can trust to, um, to be watching and listening and learning. Because it isn't just for the sake of your customer service staff. I'm going to lead you down another path for a moment and say, it's for innovation, even if you are successful. Because you, you need to be watching. You need to have um, your customer service uh, people who know your promise to their customer always thinking in those terms and putting their best um, moment forward so it never ends trust me it does not end when you are on you are on and those rules apply so again I didn't necessarily think it was the fault of the people I really wondered about who was running the show here that's how I want you all to think so I'm going to give you an analogy first to to contemplate an airplane you have a pilot but you always have a co-pilot and there's always somebody watching. This is, this is actually mission critical that I want people to, shopkeepers to understand. I've seen a lot of customers line up in a shop and the one or two um, you know, attendants failing miserably. There's no other way I could put it. I don't think it was their fault, to be quite honest. I don't think they were trained properly. But what the shopkeeper never knew was how many people actually walked out exasperated because they weren't visible. Okay, so back to my pilot. So you've got a pilot and a co-pilot. What happens when something begins to go wrong? There's always somebody there. That's number one. Number two, the sooner you get to the crisis, the faster you get it fixed. The longer you wait to deal with something that's going wrong, the worse the outcome, right? So think about that for a minute as well. All right. 
So let's start off with what not to do rather than get into my, my fundamentals for you. And I'll start with something very simple, but people tend to need to be told. Um, don't forget to treat your customer service staff with the respect they deserve because they do. And something I want you to remember, don't ever forget this, how you treat them is directly related to how they're going to treat your, your customers. And that I can assure you. Okay, so let's not forget that we need to treat them with respect. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have an issue with them, you're, and there's pl plenty of examples in the book, but just as an example, there's never any admonishing them in front of a client. You need to speak to them. It will be done in private as well as not spoken to them in front of a, other staff. You know, th those are just little things. Do you have a safe, clean, comfortable environment for them? not just your customer. I have a colleague in, in uh, Mexico. He has a wonderful, successful business. He's a distributor, he's got lovely products, he's got a great sales team, he does very well. He, he read the book, sent me a message right away and said, I thought I knew everything there was to know about uh, customer service or sales or running my business. But I found something in here I, did, I needed to address, and that was providing a very hygienic, clean uh, spaces for his sales and, and customer service team. He addressed it, they loved him for it, and he flourished even more than he had before. It was just that one little missing piece. So there's something for everybody here. And again, doesn't matter the industry, doesn't matter the platform, it matters that you pay attention to these things. So, uh, oh, and another one, do not play the blame game. Is it your responsibility? It absolutely is. I would never have blamed those four young people sitting on their phones in that room. I would have gone back to the people behind them. So as a shopkeeper, don't, don't forget and don't fail to take responsibility for that because it is yours, okay? Big one for me, do never, never, never badmouth your competition. And I can just put it very simply this way for you. You are putting them in the spotlight and you are putting yourself in very bad taste in the eyes of the client. So just remember that again, there's more in that in the book, but that is a very, very big one. Many people like to play that back and forth. Uh, it doesn't matter how much your competition may strike out, complain about you, um, behind the scenes and bad Google reviews, you know who it was, and, and it, 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 even if it wasn't true, you don't play that game. You hold yourself up in dignity and professionalism always. Because believe it or not, and I can prove this to you time and time again, the client isn't interested in that. The client is only interested in how you take care of them. Okay? So, that's a good... That's a good lead into what to focus on, okay? Absolutely. And, sorry, go ahead. Um, so we have a question, uh, a participant is asking, which resources can he use uh, for training to train um, their staff? Excellent question. Um, you know, you're very, very lucky today that you have a multi multitude of lessons and instructional videos and, and success books. I would caution you um, on not to get ca too caught up in these success books of, wow, you know, follow these 10 steps and you too can have a private plane. Well, actually it doesn't work like that. <laughs> They're not 10 easy steps, okay? I would caution that. And he's usually just taking a picture in front of one and he usually doesn't own it. But anyway, that's another story. What I highly recommend you do, do some research. Do some research of your own first. Um, and, and, and take some, the beautiful audio books that are available, uh, free courses. Do you know the Ivy League has, I found has Coursera, has beautiful free courses you can take. But do a little bit of, of learning yourself first. Take the resources you find that apply to you. And 
write your goals, your mantra, your promise to the customer. Bring that to your customer service staff. Bring um, videos to them that have struck you. Bring examples. Bring stories you've learned. Um, but one thing I would, would also impress upon you to do is, and that's what Table Talk is actually about, the second book, is open up dialogues and conversations with others who are successful and ask them point blank, what was your biggest fear? What was your failure? How did you get over it? What, 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 what point were you successful? I find that open communication with others is one of your best, best, most important resources. And you don't even know you have them necessarily. You start with who you know and you grow from there. There could be people in your own community, in your uh, youth groups, in your church, in your uh, favorite, favorite shops that you visit. Because people, people like that love to have conversations about it. I think that's one of your greatest resources. However, um, don't be afraid to create your own and ask for advice and ask for an opinion on it. Um. Wonderful. And as you said, talking to people and um, in regards to that, we have a question uh, in our chat and uh, the person says, I'm a new immigrant here. I want to open a business. Uh, could you please give me some advice about which steps sh um, should I follow to understand customer behavior? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, um this is actually, that's a very good question that leads into what I'm about to talk about. So maybe I should just go into that and then we can always address that more at the end. Does that sound good? Okay. So one of the first things I, I tell people to do with when they do want to learn um, customer service and, and, and customer value is to go out and, and look at your competition. And Maria and I discussed this before we started today. It's, it's really important. It all goes back to leaving your ears and eyes and minds open. Go and visit as many as you can. Again, it doesn't matter if it's online. You don't have to actually make a purchase. You can follow the steps. It could be phone calls. But really get out in the public. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to make two lists. What were they doing wrong? Because by now, of course, you've read my book. <laughs> and you, you understand all the things that could go wrong and, and shouldn't. But anyway, but, but go in and list what, what you found was, was not okay, and, but list what they are doing that is. What are they doing that's so fabulous? Look at the customers. Don't look at the shop, look at the customers. You'll know just by, by looking at their faces, their body language, their happiness. I go into places, I see people very down, watch their body language, they're down, they're not excited. I go into other places, people are, talking their phones are nowhere to be found they're talking they're engaging they're smiling so that's all part of it first is to really get out there find out what's going on when you build your own customer service team and, and i like that question for several reasons because in the book i i, I ex expressly am concerned about um, paying attention not to hire the wrong people the reason it's a dance is because you have to dance together that's number one can you dance together? Is there a break in the chain? Somebody that doesn't quite fit the role or isn't getting it or doesn't believe in your, your statement, your promise to the customer or your, your rules of customer service that you've given to everybody. I've had that happen to me. Three times she did something that was against what, I, what my wishes were. When I finally had to question her on it, she said, well, I just don't agree with it. Well, the only answer to that is, well, I'll remember that when I open a business for you. Okay, but this is my business and I care and this is the way I'm going to treat my customers. So this is, um, you know, these, these are the things you have to build your team appropriately. For example, don't hire your cousin's wife's brother if you know he's not right for the job, right? You get that pressure from family and you don't because you both know it's not going to work and you escalate and you build up this and animosity and again everything you have translates to the customer so be careful on who you're choosing that is really really important um, but if you when you do assemble your team you need to create a very open dialogue with them 
This is what you're looking for when you're when you have a team that you're putting together. Part of that dance is to be able to have an open dialogue with them. You need to be and be there for them. They can't obviously interrupt you, you know, whenever they do, but you need to set aside times. We will be discussing anything we open dialogue. These certain these are the certain times, these are the certain days, and here's what we'll be discussing. Again, it's all up front. So keeping an open dialogue with your staff giving them a um, um, confident, safe place to work from because you're there with them, you're on the floor, you're never leaving them to figure things out on their own. And then again, we go all, circle all the way back to blame. Well, you did that wrong. Why? We have to ask yourself why. So you're focusing on a team, your customer service team that, that you, oh, and by the way, another really, really, really important point, your customer service staff should all be different. For the very simple reason that so are your clients. None of your clients, your clients are not the same. We're individuals and, and backgrounds and desires and tastes. But we all feel comfortable dealing with someone that we can relate to. We all find that person. Let me give an example. There's, there's a place where there are three girls, all the exact same age, working for, um, we'll just say customer service. It's a disaster for two reasons. There are people that would like to relate better to other individuals, uh, not only a 17 year old. But the other thing is they spent more time fighting with each other for control and power than focusing on the client. So that, I mean, that's not, that's not about 17 year olds. It's not about females. It's about knowing that you need to have a nice um, dynamic, a nice diorama of, of different people because your clients are as well. It's like the, the, the three men, the, the 55 year old men, I've seen them in offices where they can't move forward. They're just too stuck in the old ways and they're, let's face it, we all tend to sometimes drop into that zone of, I don't get this new technology. But when you have just them, they're not learning anything either. Whereas if you put in the fresh air and the newness and the youth, then all of a sudden, oh, okay, we've got, a, we've got something to learn from each other and we're all moving forward. Um, because even when you're successful, by the way, you're always thinking about innovation. Innovation has to come up. That's one of the open dialogues you're having with your customer service staff. I went to, um, a uh, large chain uh, warehouse supplies. You know, you buy, not warehouse, sorry, uh, hardware. Hardware, big hardware supply stores. And, but it's the kind of thing that is just massive and the racks are really high and everything you buy there is really big, you know, uh, plumbing and, and, and wood and things like that. And so I, I went up to the cash and I have this cart and my, you know, my, my box is big. And as always, and you know what I mean by this, the counter space is this big. And I, I cannot navigate it. It's, it's, I'm too clumsy and they've got all this stuff that they're trying to have you sell at the you know, point, of, point of purchase selling. And I actually said to the young man, because he was such a bright, fresh young man, he was eager, he was you know, eye contact and he was happy to serve me. And regardless of how many hours he would just work or how many people I've gone through. And I said to him, because I thought I could open up the dialogue, I said, you know, this is something that's always bothered me. You sell things that are this big, but you, the spaces are this little, and I can't navigate it. And you know what he said to me? Oh, he said, I know, I've been telling the people upstairs that, and they don't want to listen to me. And I said, is that right? He goes, oh, yeah, I, I talk to them all the time, and, but they, they know it. They really help you with that. Is that helpful? Um, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Um, by the way, I do, I, I, do, um, I do like when people reach out to me after I do the seminars because um, if, if, if anybody would feel more comfortable asking me uh, something in private or having a conversation about it, I am completely open to that. I've dedicated myself to helping people um, bring themselves forward the best that they can. And, but we all have things to learn. There was a point where everything I do now, I had to learn and it took a long time to do it. And, and I'm still, let's not say that I'm necessarily overly confident in it. I still talk to people. I still look for ideas and I, and I still look for great examples. What I've just become very good at, I can walk into any situation 
and I see everything. Very little gets by me when it comes to, to customer service. So even if it's just those little questions, then feel free to, to bring those to me. Um, so I think what's really important right now to say is that everybody has to have the same goal. And there is only one goal, and that's to make a transaction because nothing happens without it. Okay, if I had to put one word that um, that uh, would be for everybody on your team, on your in your 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 dance troupe, we'll call it a troupe now. But there's only one word that unites every single person. Okay, and that's success. Because isn't that why you're doing it? Don't you want to have the success? You're doing it because you're putting yourself forward with um, what your choice is, your, your product or service. But you all want success. And when you focus on that, there's no reason to have all the other unnecessary drama, all the un unnecessary heartaches. They will happen, don't get me wrong, but it's how you address them. That you have to stand confidently in and say, all right, we gotta, we gotta deal with this. Okay, you, you go to, I, I go to a grocery store, I've got fresh tomatoes and I've got a brick of ice cream and other things. And I actually say to the person, don't put the, you know, could you just, just, this is how I like to have things bagged. I don't want the fresh stuff with the hard stuff, you know, that sort of thing. One of two things happens. The first, the, the, the first thing that usually happens, I get the shoulder. They turn their back. They just want me to leave. Oh, she's one of those. She has like issues and they just throw in the bag and they turn around, wait to go to the next customer. I don't shop at places like that for a second time. The places I shop at are the, are, are the people who stand when there's nobody in their checkout. Oh, I'm free. I'm available. Come. And I get to say what I want and how I want to. I'm the customer. Don't ever forget. They are the client. Okay. And I say how I want things done. And they say, oh gosh, I know, you know, no problem, no problem. Even if they get it wrong, I don't care because they responded. You know, I've, I've got a whole list of things in the book that talk about how appropriately to do that. No phones, you know, your personal phone, maintaining eye contact. Here's a big one. How about sorry? Well, you know what? I'm really, really sorry. When a client walks into you, and she's already had a, an hour and a, her first hour and a half of the day. She, her, her cat kept her up all night with, with uh, uh, its own problems. She slept in, she was late for work. She did not finish the night before the presentation her, her boss is now looking for. And she's stopping in in your shop to pick up her morning coffee. I'm gonna tell you something. You're not going to be the worst part of her day. You're going to be the best part of her day. You're not going to talk about your, your own trials and tribulations that day, that week, that year. You're not going to forget how she said she liked her coffee. You're going to pay such very close attention because you're going to look at her and know she's having a really rough day. So you're going to do everything you can to make her day and say, there you go. It's on the house and you're gonna hand her her coffee. And she's going to now remember, she will never forget that was the brightest part of her day. Make it you, make you her brightest part of her day, okay? And by the way, if you did get her coffee order wrong, there's no need for running away, hoping she leaves, maybe she'll never come back. There's all the room for, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. It's on the house. Let me get it. Let me fix it. And away you go. I hope your day gets better. It's the only way to answer that. Okay. So that is a very, very small example. Very, very small example. You know, that, that, but that sort of explains everything of what it is I want to say. I had three young men who designed this unbelievable, um, it was an online service and they had it down and they were, um, you know, it was exciting. It was something new. Everybody was happy about it while I was writing this first book. And I said, well, that's great. You know, what, what are you doing for your customer service team? Don't wait till you're ready. And they said, oh, no, we don't need one. You don't need one. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Three months later, they came back and said, hmm, we need one. Make no mistake. You better have some way of being able to connect 
with your clients, right? Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if, if you know it's a uh, it's a service they do on their own. You don't even have to be visible. It doesn't matter. You still need them. So don't forget to um, is understanding when you're building your team. We're, again, we're talking about the dance. Who who is good at what? I'll say this again. Who who is good at what? And and when does that change? And how do you change it? Because. Your clients are going to wave in and out and they're going to change and their demands are going to change. So be ready to change, be ready to adapt. That doesn't mean replacing your customer service staff. It means following that, changing it and adapt it. I have been working with a um, small business, a small private uh, family business. Um, the first three years, they had a lot of things they wanted to try and they, they figured it out and they were doing really, really well. So right at that minute, when they say, okay, we've got this, is when I walk in and I say, now, how are you going to move into the future? I said, well, what do you mean? Well, what can you do better? What can you change? Well, I, it's, but it's working. Okay, then go ask your clients. Go ask your customers, what else can you do? If it's working, if, the, if everybody's dancing and it's flowing, what happens when things change? Are you going to be ready? What happens when you're the person that creates the new, the new innovation to introduce to your clients? That's when you do it. That's when you, it doesn't stop. The dance doesn't stop. You need to keep that communication. And it, and it begins with being, again, the fundamentals. You're going to train them. You're going to write your promise. You're going to train them. You're going to watch them. You're going to be on the floor with them working. With, there is nothing you won't do that they do, don't ever forget that. Jim Donald, he was the CEO of Starbucks for about eight years. He's a friend of mine. And you know the best thing that I heard him say when he spoke to, to, you know, to, um, to business owners? He always knew where the mop and bucket was, always. Because he didn't always have to get it out, but he wasn't afraid to. Because as a shopkeeper, there is no job you will not do. And that goes a monumental way with your customer service staff, right? So. So, so true, Sherry. Uh, thank you. I, about uh, I stay ahead of changes and um, online businesses right now with COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, situation. Mm -hmm. How can businesses uh, build a successful strategy? Um, well, customer service online businesses. I'll, I'll tell you what my what my personal philosophy is on that, and I've I've seen it happen with some of the greats out in the industries. Leave aside because we know that this it's not likely to be permanent. We don't know quite how long, but we know it's a chunk of time before you know because we're all doing what we can and and we're uniting and i love this but eventually we are going to have to we will be having to to get back to work and the new normal right um but two things i've seen happen i've seen the unleaders fall out of the tree okay the unleaders are the ones who in the beginning complained how inconvenienced they were those are the people that I would say, well, I don't, I'm not, won't be listening to them really quite. And I'm not surprised it was them that fell out of the tree with their own. They made it too personal for themselves. This is hurting them. Uh, this is her, you know, now let's talk about the other side. What I have seen happen and, and think about it this way, because it's not in the grand scheme of things too long so far from what we know, forget the idea that you have to maintain status quo and be successful. You have to still keep, you know, keep the machine going and bring money in. You don't. You are going to actually uh, do better in the long run if you remove all of that and focus on how to help and serve your clients in the best way you're capable of. I'm not asking you to, um, to do things you cannot afford to do. But you, that's where your, your mindfulness comes in. That's where your thinking kept in. What can I do to help them? I've got to be able to do something to help them. It's only temporary, so I'm not looking at the numbers, okay? I'm, not, I'm thinking, hmm, let me give an example. I know a business owner in Toronto. He is quite high profile now. He's not one of those famous people that have the podcasts and the books. 
He's very high profile because he owns his craft and he is a beautiful artist in what he does. So, but it relies on, on daily public interaction. And so he, everybody, I like the word pivot. People are using it this, this, today. When you pivot, okay, let me think. Okay, um, well, how am I gonna be able to do this? I'm not gonna be able to make money necessary on this, but it keeps me in the public's view and it gives me of service to them in a different way. And he started doing what he does in the shop online for free. So what it was he was making, you weren't getting the product necessarily, but you were getting, guess what? This is how I make it. This is how I do it. And I'm, I'm giving you a peek inside my artistry, my craft. Unbelievable. This is how I say that if, I mean, if you can't work anyways, you're not, you're not working, you can't open shop. There are ways to reach your public and say, and put yourself out there and say, you know, I'm going to give you something of what I can. I gave away my second book for the month of March to anybody who asked. Um, you know, you don't make, <laughs> it's kind of a, um, a fallacy. You, you don't make a lot of money as an author. I mean, that's for the, you know, the big people that sell millions worldwide. Mine are labors of love. This is what I want to do and I love to do. So I, that was all I could do. I said, hey, and, and, you know, I'd love to talk to you. Let's have conversations. Now that you're not necessarily working or opening, why don't we have conversations? You know, you can offer your clients something. And I want you to be mindful of that. Sit to ask your team, brainstorm. This artist, um, by the way, he's one of the top chefs in Toronto. Okay. And this, he, and I'm going to tell you right now, he has a customer service policy bar none. It's the most fabulous I've seen, but I've also seen him and he's got three places. I've also seen him in one of his, where he's doing his daily powwow with the, with the top staff because he's got three locations and they're all there at the one location and they're, they're talking, they're discussing and he's listening, you know, and, uh, but he, that's what he did. He decided, well, I can't bring you my product, but I can sure as heck show you how to make it. And, you know, maybe you'll fall in love with it that way too. So. Oh, that's, that's great, Sherry. Well, unfortunately we are um, running out of time, but I would like to finish uh, this webinar with a question that, that I know a lot of entrepreneurs ask to themselves because of course in the startup Canada, we interact with entrepreneurs on a daily basis. And so the question is, Yes, so we have the fundamentals of customer um, service, um, how to be successful in our strategy, but how can entrepreneurs find their own style in that differentiates uh, their customer service and that makes them stand out um, from their, their peers or competition? Uh, two things. Number one, um, I was very, very, very lucky to be able to meet um, Steve Wozniak. Now, Steve Wozniak is the original co-founder of Apple, okay? And if you were to ask him that question, he says it this way, very, very simply. Invent the thing that you want that doesn't exist. And to me, there's no better way to state that's where you start, okay? Um, but the other thing is where I come from, I'm a 50, 50 position. I say, work it out, work it out. Think about it, spend time, go out there, go out there and see what's happening. Whether it's your product or your service, look at your competition. What is out there? And, 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 but what do you want? How, how do I do that? What would I do to make that my way? But the other half of that is to, you have to get started because half of that, that learning, that knowledge is going to come from your clients because you are talking to them, because you are asking them. So it's a different, uh, it's a different feel for a lot of different people. How do I do that? It starts by learning as much as you can, just like I did back in 1986 or 84, 85, whenever it was. I, 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 I literally took a job as a receptionist and decided to learn as much as I could about the actual business, the way it was operating. And I often tell people all the time, you start in the basement. I don't know if many of you are old enough to know what that term means, but starting in the basement, back in the old days, a, a business, a company had a, 
uh, say 10 stories, 20 stories high building. The, uh, the mail room was in the basement and the mail room serviced all the floors, all the different departments of the, the company. So starting in the mail room or starting in the basement means you start at the ground and you learn as much as you can about every single level. No matter if there's three levels or 20, there's could be, and that is what I did. For anybody who wants to develop a product or service, they have to ask themselves those two things. Okay, what, what is it we don't have? What don't we have? And by the way, that's how you also design your customer service. What are people not doing? Well, this is, you know, I, this is how we should be servicing our client. Go out and watch. There's a lot of people dropping a lot of balls. So maybe that's where you start. Geez, they really dropped the ball on that. I could do that much better because I'm really interested in that. It comes with interest, exploration, design, and then talking to your clients. Um, thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful answer and advice, Cherry. Um, do we have any other question from our audience before we wrap up with Cherry? Uh, I... I don't think so. So if we don't have any other question uh, from the audience, we can wrap things up. Thank okay. you so much, Sherry, for this amazing presentation. Thank you for taking this time to share all this wonderful advice with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Maria. Um, you know, we talked originally about, well, we'll try and keep it under an hour. And you know, I can, <laughs> I, I say, well, try and stop me then. I really highly recommend, all of those questions are super, super huge, important. Please read the book. It's gonna give you a lot of insight. Amazing. Um, Cherry, and you mentioned that if somebody wants to contact you, yes. uh, ask you some questions, they can contact you directly. Um, which, yes. Uh, there, there is an email in the back of the book, but I will say it now to everybody who would like to have it. Um, you can really, really reach me. It's very simple if you know how to spell my name, okay? So Sherry, S-H-A-R-I dot A-N-N-E, Sherry Ann with an E, at sherrymoss.ca. Matter of fact, I'll type it, I'll type it in there at the bottom. Um, okay, let me just get that in there quickly for you. At sherrymoss.ca. That looks like it worked. Okay, <laughs> but um, I had a talk at, in, at the University of Indiana and it was really lovely how some of them managed to stay in touch after and I, I really enjoyed that too. So. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sherry, uh, to our amazing audience. Thank you so much for joining us today in the webinar, Entrepreneurs Webinar. Uh, we hope you got valuable insights about how to give the best service to customers because every interaction counts for the success of your business. Um, stay tuned for our next webinar, how to activate your wise uh, woman inner power with Linda Babulik, author of the Amazon number one international bestseller, Says Your Life. Um, the webinar series will be recorded and uploaded uh, under the webinar entrepreneurs program section in the Startup Canada website. Mm -hmm. um, also, Register now to the Startup Canada Social Impact Program in partnership with the Economic and Social Development Canada's Investment Readiness Program. Uh, we will share all of the links um, in the webinar takeaways um, that uh, I will email to you shortly, along with this webinar YouTube link. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to our next webinar this Thursday. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> okay. There we go. Ooh,